Chapter twenty six of Lorna Doone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lorna Doone by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter twenty six. John is drained and cast aside. His lordship was busy with some letters, and did not look up for a minute or two, although he knew that I was there. Meanwhile, I stood waiting to make my bow afraid to begin upon him, and wondering at his great bull head. Then he closed his letters, well pleased with their import, and fixed his bold broad stare on me, as if I were an oyster opened, and he would know how fresh I was. "'May it please your worship,' I said, "'here I am, according to order, awaiting your good pleasure.' "'Thou art made to wait, John, more than order. How much dost thou tip the scales to?' "'Only twelve score pounds, my lord, when I be in wrestling, Trim. "'And sure I must have lost weight here, fretting so long in London.' "'Ha, oh, oh, ha! Much fret is there in thee! Has his majesty seen thee?' "'Yes, my lord, twice, or even thrice, and he made some jest concerning me. "'A very bad one, I doubt not. His humour is not so dainty as mine, but apt to be coarse and unmannerly. "'Now, John, or Jack, by the look of thee, thou art more used to be called.' "'Yes, your worship, when I am with old Molly and Betty Muxworthy.' "'Peace, thou forward varlet! There is a deal too much of thee. We shall have to try short commons with thee, and thou art a very long common. Ha, ha! Where is that rogue Spank? Spank must hear that by and by. It is beyond thy great thick head, Jack.' "'Not so, my lord. I have been at school, and had very bad jokes made upon me.' "'Ha, ha! It hath hit thee hard.' and face it would be hard to miss thee even with a harpoon and thou lookest like to blubber now capital in faith i have thee on every side jack and thy sides are manyfold many folded at any rate thou shalt have double expenses jack for the wit thou hast provoked in me heavy goods lack heavy payment is a proverb down our way my lord ah i hurt thee i hurt thee jack the harpoon hath no tickle for thee now, Jack Whale, having hauled thee hard, we will proceed to examine thee. Here all his manner was changed, and he looked with his heavy brows bent upon me, as if he had never laughed in his life, and would allow none else to do so. I am ready to answer, my lord, I replied, if he ask me not beyond my knowledge, or beyond my honour. Hadst better answer me everything, lump. What hast thou to do with honour? Now, is there in thy neighbourhood a certain nest of robbers, miscreants, and outlaws, whom all men fear to handle? Yes, my lord. At least I believe some of them be robbers, and all of them are outlaws. And what is your high sheriff about, that he doth not hang them all, or send them up for me to hang, without more to do about them? I reckon that he is afraid, my lord. It is not safe to meddle with them. They are of good birth, and reckless, and their place is very strong. Good birth! What was Lord Russell of, Lord Essex, and this Sydney? Tis the surest airship to the block to be the chip of a good one. What is the name of this pestilent race, and how many of them are there? They are the dunes of Bagworthy Forest, may it please your worship, and we reckon there be about forty of them, beside the women and children. Forty dunes, all forty thieves, and women and children. Thunder of God! How long have they been there, then? They may have been there thirty years, my lord, and indeed they may have been forty. Before the great war broke out they came, longer back than I can remember. Ay, long before thou wast born, John. Good, thou speakest plainly. Woe betide a liar when so I get hold of him. Ye want me on the western circuit, by God, and ye shall have me when London traitors are spun and swung. There is a family called de Wickerhauser living very nigh thee, John. This he said in a sudden manner, as if to take me off my guard, and fixed his great thick eyes on me, and in truth I was much astonished. "'Yes, my lord, there is, at least not so very far from us, Baron de Wickerhauser of Les Menor. "'Baron, ha, of the exchequer, eh, lad? And taketh dues instead of his majesty. Somewhat which halts there ought to come a little further, I trow. It shall be seen, too, as well as the witch which makes it so to halt.' riotous knaves in west england drunken outlaws you shall dance if ever i play pipe for you john ridd i will come to oar parish and rout out the oar of babylon although your worship is so learned i answered seeing that now he was beginning to make things uneasy 
your worship, though being chief justice, does little justice to us. We are downright good and loyal folk, and I have not seen, since here I came to this great town of London, any who may better us, or even come anigh us in honesty and goodness and duty to our neighbours. For we are very quiet folk, not prating our own virtues. Enough, good John, enough! Knowest thou not that modesty is the maidenhood of virtue, lost even by her own approval? Now, hast thou ever heard or thought that de Wickerhauser is in league with the dunes of Bagworthy? Saying these words rather slowly, he skewered his great eyes into mine, so that I could not think at all, neither look at him, nor yet away. The idea was so new to me that it set my wits all wandering, and looking into me he saw that I was groping for the truth. "'John Ridd, thine eyes are enough for me. I see thou hast never dreamed of it. Now, hast thou ever seen a man whose name is Thomas Faggus?' "'Yes, sir, many and many a time. He is my own worthy cousin, and I fear that he hath intentions—' Here I stopped, having no right there to speak about our any. "'Tom Faggus is a good man,' he said, and his great square face had a smile which showed me he had met my cousin. "'Master Faggus hath made mistakes as to the title to property, as lawyers oftentimes may do. But take him all for all, he is a thoroughly straightforward man, presents his bill, and has it paid, and makes no charge for drawing it. Nevertheless, we must tax his costs, as of any other solicitor.' "'To be sure, to be sure, my lord,' was all that I could say, not understanding what all this meant. "'I fear he will come to the gallows,' said the Lord Chief Justice, sinking his voice below the echoes. "'Tell him this from me, Jack. He shall never be condemned before me, but I cannot be everywhere, and some of our justices may keep short memory of his dinners. Tell him to change his name, turn parson, or do something else to make it wrong to hang him. Parson is the best thing. He hath such command of features, and he might take his tithes on horseback. Now, a few more things, John Ridd, and for the present I have done with thee. All my heart leaped up at this to get away from London so, and yet I could hardly trust to it. "'Is there any sound round your way of disaffection to His Majesty, His Most Gracious Majesty?' "'No, my lord, no sign whatever. We pray for him in church, perhaps, and we talk about him afterwards, hoping it may do him good, as it is intended. But after that we have naught to say, not knowing much about him, at least, till I get home again.' "'That is as it should be, John, and the less you say, the better.' But I have heard of things in Taunton, and even nearer to you in Dulverton, and even nigher still upon Exmoor, things which are of the pillory kind, and even more of the gallows. I see that you know naught of them. Nevertheless, it will not be long before all England hears of them. Now, John, I have taken a liking to thee, for never man told me the truth without fear or favour more thoroughly and truly than thou hast done. Keep thou clear of this, my son." It will come to nothing, yet many shall swing high for it. Even I could not save thee, John Ridd, if thou wert mixed in this affair. Keep from the dunes, keep from de Wickerhauser, keep from everything which leads beyond the sight of thy knowledge. I meant to use thee as my tool, but I see thou art too honest and simple. I will send a sharper down. But never let me find thee, John, either a tool for the other side, or a tube for my words to pass through." Here the Lord Justice gave me such a glare that I wished myself well rid of him, though thankful for his warnings, and seeing how he had made upon me a long abiding mark of fear, he smiled again in a jocular manner, and said, "'Now get thee gone, Jack. I shall remember thee, and I trow, thou wilt not for many a day forget me.' "'My Lord, I was never so glad to go, for the hay must be in, and the ricks unthatched, and none of them can make spars like me, and two men to twist every hay-rope, and mother thinking it all right, and listening right and left to lies, and cheated at every pig she kills, and even the skins of the sheep to go, "'John Ridd! I thought none could come nigh your folk in honesty and goodness and duty to their neighbours. "'Sure enough, my lord, but by our folk I mean ourselves, not the men nor women neither. "'That will do, John. Go thy way. Not men nor women neither are better than they need be.' I wished to set this matter right, but his worship would not hear me, and only drove me out of court, saying that men were thieves and liars, no more in one place than another, but all alike all over the world, and women not far behind them. It was not for me to dispute this point, though I was not yet persuaded of it, 
both because my lord was a judge and must know more about it, and also that being a man myself, I might seem to be defending myself in an unbecoming manner. Therefore I made a low bow and went, in doubt as to which had the right of it. But though he had so far dismissed me, I was not yet quite free to go, inasmuch as I had not money enough to take me all the way to Oar, unless, indeed, I should go afoot, and beg my sustenance by the way, which seemed to be below me. Therefore I got my few clothes packed, and my few debts paid, all ready to start in half an hour, if only they would give me enough to set out upon the road with. For I doubted not, being young and strong, that I could walk from London to Oar in ten days, or in twelve at most which was not much longer than horse-work, only I had been a fool, as you will say when you hear it. For after receiving from Master Spank the amount of the bill which I had delivered, less, indeed, by fifty shillings than the money my mother had given me, for I had spent fifty shillings and more in seeing the town and treating people, which I could not charge to His Majesty, I had first paid all my debts thereout, which were not very many, and then, supposing myself to be an established creditor of the treasury for my coming needs, and already scenting the country air, and foreseeing the joy of my mother, what had I done but spent half my balance, ay, and more than three-quarters of it, upon presents for mother, and Enny, and Lizzie, John Fry, and his wife, and Betty Muxworthy, Bill Dads, Jim Slocombe, and in a word, half of the rest of the people at Oa, including all the Snow family, who must have things good and handsome. And if I must, while I am about it, hide nothing from those who read me, I had actually bought for Lorna a thing the price of which quite frightened me, till the shopkeeper said it was nothing at all, and that no young man with a lady to love him could dare to offer her rubbish, such as the Jew sold across the way. Now the mere idea of beautiful Lorna ever loving me, which he talked about as patly, though of course I never mentioned her, as if it were a settled thing, and he knew all about it, that mere idea so drove me abroad, that if he had asked three times as much, I could never have counted the money. Now in all this I was a fool, of course, not for remembering my friends and neighbours, which a man has a right to do, and indeed is bound to do when he comes from London, but for not being certified first what cash I had to go on with. And to my great amazement, when I went with another bill for the victuals of only three days more, and a week's expense on the homeward road reckoned very narrowly, Master Spank not only refused to grant me any interview, but sent me out a piece of blue paper, looking like a butcher's ticket, and bearing these words and no more. John Ridd, go to the devil. He who will not when he may, when he will, he shall have nay. From this I concluded that I had lost favour in the sight of Chief Justice Jeffreys, perhaps because my evidence had not proved of any value, perhaps because he meant to let the matter lie till cast on him. Anyhow, it was a reason of much grief, and some anger to me, and very great anxiety, disappointment, and suspense. For here was the time of the hay gone past, and the harvest of small corn coming on, and the trout now rising at the yellow sally, and the blackbirds eating our white heart cherries, I was sure, though I could not see them, and who was to do any good for mother, or stop her from weeping continually? And more than this, what was become of Lorna? Perhaps she had cast me away altogether, as a flouter and a changeling, Perhaps she had drowned herself in the black well. Perhaps, and that was worst of all, she was even married, child as she was, to that vile carver Doon, if the Doones ever cared about marrying. The last thought sent me down at once to watch for Mr. Spank again, resolved that if I could catch him, spank him I would to a pretty good tune, although sixteen in family. However, there was no such thing as to find him, and the usher vowed, having orders, I doubt, that he was gone to the sea for the good of his health, having sadly overworked himself, and that none but a poor devil like himself, who never had handling of money, would stay in London, this foul, hot weather, which was likely to bring the plague with it. Here was another new terror for me, who had heard of the plagues of London, and the horrible things that happened, and so, going back to my lodgings at once, I opened my clothes and sought for spots, especially as being so long at a hairy fellmonger's, but finding none, I fell down and thanked God for that same, and vowed to start for a while to-morrow, with my carbine loaded, come will, come woe, come sun, come shower, though all the parish should laugh at me for begging my way home again, after the brave things said of my going, as if I had been the king's cousin. But I was saved in some degree from this lowering of my pride, and what mattered more, of mother's, for going down to buy with my last crown piece, after all demands were paid, a little shot and powder, 
more needful on the road almost than even shoes or victuals at the corner of the street i met my good friend jeremy stickles newly come in search of me i took him back to my little room mine at least till to-morrow morning and told him all my story and how much i felt aggrieved by it but he surprised me very much by showing no surprise at all it is the way of the world jack they have gotten all they can from thee and why should they feed thee further we feed not a dead pig i trow but baste him well with brine and rue nay we do not victual him upon the day of killing which they have done to thee thou art a lucky man john thou hast gotten one day's wages or at any rate half a day after thy work was rendered god have mercy on me john the things i see are manifold and so is my regard of them what use to insist on this or make a special point of that or hold by something said of old when a different mood was on i tell thee jack all men are liars and he is the least one who presses not too hard on them for lying this was all quite dark to me for i never looked at things like that and never would own myself a liar not at least to other people nor even to myself although i might to god sometimes when trouble was upon me and if it comes to that no man has any right to be called a liar for smoothing over things unwitting through duty to his neighbour five pounds thou shalt have jack said jeremy stickle suddenly while i was all abroad with myself as to being a liar or not five pounds and i will take my chance of wringing it from that great rogue spank ten i would have made it john but for bad luck lately put back your bits of paper lad i will have no acknowledgment john ridd no nonsense with me for i was ready to kiss his hand to think that any man in london the meanest and most suspicious place upon all god's earth should trust me with five pounds without even a receipt for it it overcame me so that i sobbed for after all though big in body i am but a child at heart it was not the five pounds that moved me but the way of giving it and after so much bitter talk the great trust in my goodness end of chapter twenty six read by landy in sydney australia september two thousand and eight Chapter twenty seven of Lorna Doone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lorna Doone by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter twenty seven. Home again at last. It was the beginning of wheat harvest when I came to Dunster Town, having walked all the way from London and being somewhat footsore. For though five pounds was enough to keep me in food and lodging upon the road, and leave me many a shilling to give to far poorer travellers it would have been nothing for horse hire as i knew too well by the prices jeremy stickles had paid upon our way to london now i never saw a prettier town than dunster looked that evening for sooth to say i had almost lost all hope of reaching it that night although the castle was long in view but being once there my troubles were gone at least as regarded wayfaring for mother's cousin the worthy tanner with whom we had slept on the way to london was in such indignation at the plight in which I came back to him, afoot and weary, and almost shoeless, not to speak of upper things, that he swore then, by the mercy of God, that if the schemes are brewing round him against those bloody papers should come to any head or shape, and show a good chance of succeeding, he would risk a thousand pounds as though it were a penny. I told him not to do it, because I had heard otherwise, but was not at liberty to tell one-tenth of what I knew, and indeed had seen in london town but of this he took no heed because i only nodded at him and he could not make it out for it takes an old man or at least a middle-aged one to nod and wink with any power on the brains of other men however i think i made him know that the bad state in which i came to his town and the great shame i had wrought for him among the folk round the card-table at the luttrell arms was not to be even there attributed to king charles the second nor even to his counsellors but to my own speed of travelling, which had beat post-horses. For being much distraught in mind and desperate in body, I had made all the way from London to Dunster in six days and no more. It may be one hundred and seventy miles, I cannot tell to a furlong or two, especially as I lost my way more than a dozen times, but at any rate there in six days I was, and most kindly they received me. The tanner had some excellent daughters, I forget how many, very pretty damsels and well set up and able to make good pastry but though they asked me many questions and made a sort of lord of me and offered to dine my stockings which in truth required it 
I fell asleep in the midst of them, although I would not acknowledge it, and they said, Poor cousin, he is weary, and led me to a blessed bed, and kissed me all round like swans down. In the morning, all the Exmoor hills, the thought of which had frightened me at the end of each day's travel, seemed no more than bushels to me, as I looked forth the bedroom window and thanked God for the sight of them. And even so I had not to climb them, at least by my own labour. For my own worthy uncle, as we oft call a parent's cousin, finding it impossible to keep me for the day, and owning indeed that I was right in hastening to my mother, vowed that walk I should not, even though he lost his Saturday hides from Minehead and from Watchet. Accordingly, he sent me forth on the very strongest nag he had, and the maidens came to wish me Godspeed, and kiss their hands at the doorway. It made me proud and glad to think that after seeing so much of the world, and having held my own with it, I was come once more among my own people, and found them kinder, and more warm-hearted, aye, and better looking too, than almost any I had happened upon in the mighty city of London. But how shall I tell you the things I felt, and the swelling of my heart within me, as I drew nearer and more near to the place of all I loved and owned, to the haunt of every warm remembrance, the nest of all the fledgling hopes, in a word, to home? The first sheep I beheld on the moor with a great red J.R. on his side, for mother would have them marked with my name instead of her own as they should have been. I do assure you my spirit leaped, and all my sight came to my eyes. I shouted out, Jem, boy! for that was his name, and a rare hand he was at fighting. And he knew me, in spite of the stranger horse, and I leaned over and stroked his head, and swore he should never be mutton. And when I was past, he set off at full gallop, to call the rest of the J.R.s together, and tell them the young master was come home at last. But bless your heart, and my own as well, it would take me all the afternoon to lay before you one-tenth of the things which came home to me in that one half-hour, as the sun was sinking in the real way he ought to sink. I touched my horse with no spur nor whip, feeling that my slow wits would go if the sights came too fast over them. Here was the pool where we washed the sheep, and there was the hollow that oozed away where I had shot three wild ducks. Here was the peat rick that hid my dinner when I could not go home for it, and there was the bush with the thyme growing round it, where any had found a great swarm of our bees. And now was the corner of the dry stone wall, where the moor gave over in earnest, and the partridges whisked from it into the cornlands, and called that their supper was ready, and looked at our house and the ricks as they ran, and would wait for that comfort till winter. And there I saw, but let me go, any was too much for me. She nearly pulled me off my horse, and kissed the very mouth of the carbine. I knew you would come. Oh, John! Oh, John, I have waited here every Saturday night, and I saw you for the last mile or more, but I would not come round the corner for fear that I should cry, John, and then not cry when I got you. Now I may cry as much as I like, and you need not try to stop me, John, because I am so happy. But you mustn't cry yourself, John. What will mother think of you? She will be so jealous of me. What mother thought, I cannot tell. Indeed, I doubt if she thought at all for more than half an hour but only managed to hold me tight, and cry, and thank God now and then, but with some fear of his taking me if she should be too grateful. Moreover, she thought it was my own doing, and I ought to have the credit of it, and she even came down very sharply upon John's wife, Mrs. Fry, for saying that we must not be too proud, for all of it was the Lord's doing. However, dear mother was ashamed of that afterwards, and asked Mrs. Fry's humble pardon, and perhaps I ought not to have mentioned it. Old Smiler had told them that I was coming, all the rest I mean, except any, for having escaped from his halter ring, he was come out to graze in the lane a bit, when what should he see but a strange horse coming with young master and mistress upon him, for any must needs get up behind me, there being only sheep to look at her. Then Smiler gave us a stare and a neigh, with his tail quite stiff with amazement, and then, whether in joy or through indignation, he flung up his hind feet and galloped straight home, and set every dog wild with barking. Now, methinks, quite enough has been said concerning this mighty return of the young John Ridd, which was known up at Cosgate that evening, and feeling that I cannot describe it, how can I hope that any one else will labour to imagine it, even of the few who are able? For very few can have travelled so far, unless, indeed, they whose trade it is, or very unsettled people. And even of those who have done so, not one in a hundred can have such a home as I had to come home to. Mother wept again, with grief and some wrath, and so did Annie also, 
and even little Eliza, and all were unsettled in loyalty and talked about a republic, when I told them how I had been left without money for travelling homeward, and expected to have to beg my way, which Farmer Snow would have heard of. And though I could see they were disappointed at my failure of any promotion, they all declared how glad they were, and how much better they liked me to be no more than what they were accustomed to. At least, my mother and Annie said so, without waiting to hear any more, but Lizzie did not answer to it until I had opened my bag and shown the beautiful present I had for her, and then she kissed me, almost like Annie, and vowed that she thought very little of captains. For Lizzie's present was the best of all, I mean, of course, except Lorna's, which I had carried in my breast all the way, hoping that it might make her love me from having lain so long close to my heart for I had brought Lizzie something dear, and a precious heavy book it was, and much beyond my understanding, whereas I knew well that to both the others my gifts would be dear for mine own sake, and happier people could not be found than the whole of us were that evening. End of chapter 27 Read by Landy in Sydney, Australia, September 2008
to see the leaves across the window ruffling on the fresh new air, and the tendrils of the powdery vine turning from their beaded sleep. Then the lustrous meadows far beyond the thatch of the garden wall, yet seen beneath the hanging scallops of the walnut tree, all awaking, dressed in pearl, all amazed at their own glistening, like a maid at her own ideas. Down them troop the lowing kine, walking each with a step of character, even as men and women do, yet all alike with toss of horns and spread of udders ready. From them, without a word, we turn to the farmyard proper, seen on the right, and dryly strawed from the petty rush of the pitch-paved runnel. Round it stand the snug outbuildings, barn, corn-chamber, cider-press, stables, with a blinkered horse in every doorway munching while his driver tightens buckles, whistles and looks down the lane, dallying to begin his labor till the milkmaids be gone by. Here the cock comes forth at last. Where has he been lingering? Eggs may tell to-morrow. He claps his wings and shouts, Cock-a-doodle! And no other cock dare look at him. Two or three go sidling off, waiting till their spurs be grown. And then the crowd of partlets comes, chattering how their lord has dreamed, and crowed at two in the morning, and praying that the old brown rat would only dare to face him. But while the cock is crowing still, and the pullet world admiring him, who comes up but the old turkey-cock with all his family round him? Then the geese at the lower end begin to thrust their breasts out, and mum their down-bits, and look at the gander and scream shrill joy for the conflict, while the ducks in pond show nothing but tail, in proof of their strict neutrality. While yet we dread for the coming event, and the fight which would jar on the morning, behold the grandmother of sows, gruffly grunting right and left, with muzzle which no ring may tame, not being matrimonial, hulks across between the two, moving all each side at once, and then all of the other side, as if she were chying down the middle, and afraid of spilling the salt from her. As this mighty view of lard hides each combatant from the other, Gladly each retires and boasts how he would have slain his neighbor, but that old sow drove the other away, and no wonder he was afraid of her, after all the chicks she had eaten. And so it goes on, and so the sun comes, stronger from his drink of dew, and the cattle in the byres, and the horses from the stable, and the men from cottage door, each has had his rest and food, all smell alike of hay and straw, and every one must hie to work be it drag or draw or delve. So thought I on the Monday morning, while my own work lay before me, and I was plotting how to quit it, void of harm to every one, and let my love have work a little, hardest perhaps of all work, and yet as sure as sunrise. I knew that my first day's task on the farm would be strictly watched by every one, even by my gentle mother, to see what I had learned in London. But could I let still another day pass, for Lorna to think me faithless? I felt much inclined to tell dear mother all about Lorna and how I loved her, yet had no hope of winning her. Often and often I had longed to do this and have done with it. But the thought of my father's terrible death at the hands of the dunes prevented me. And it seemed to me foolish and mean to grieve mother, without any chance of my suit ever speeding. If once Lorna loved me, my mother should know it, and it would be the greatest happiness to me to have no concealment from her, though at first she was sure to grieve terribly. But I saw no more chance of Lorna loving me than of the man in the moon coming down, or rather of the moon coming down to the man, as related in old mythology. Now the merriment of the small birds, and the clear voice of the waters, and the lowing of cattle in meadows, and the view of no houses, except just our own and a neighbor's, and the knowledge of everybody around, their kindness of heart and simplicity, and love of their neighbor's doings, all these could not help or please me at all, and many of them were much against me, in my secret depth of longing and dark tumult of the mind. Many people may think me foolish, especially after coming from London, where many nice maids looked at me, on account of my bulk and stature, and I might have been fitted up with a sweetheart, in spite of my West Country twang and the smallness of my purse, if only I had said the word. 
But nay, I have contempt for a man whose heart is like a shirt-stud, such as I saw in London cards, fitted into one to-day, sitting bravely on the breast, plucked out on the morrow morn, and the place that knew it gone. Now what did I do but take my chance? Reckless whether any one heeded me or not, only craving Lorna's heed, and time for ten words to her. Therefore I left the men of the farm as far away as might be, after making them work with me, which no man round our parts could do, to his own satisfaction, and then knowing them to be well weary, very unlike to follow me, and still more unlike to tell of me, for each had his London present, I strode right away, in good trust of my speed, without any more misgivings, but resolved to face the worst of it, and to try to be home for supper. And first I went, I know not why, to the crest of the broken highland, whence I had agreed to watch for any mark or signal. And sure enough at last I saw, when it was too late to see, that the white stone had been covered over with a cloth or mantle, the sign that something had arisen to make Lorna want me. For a moment I stood amazed at my evil fortune, that I should be too late, in the very thing of all things on which my heart was set. Then, after eyeing sorrowfully every crick and cranny, to be sure that not a single flutter of my love was visible, off I set, with small respect either for my knees or neck, to make the round of the outer cliffs, and come up my old access. Nothing could stop me. It was not long, although to me it seemed an age, before I stood in the niche of rock at the head of the slippery watercourse, and gazed into the quiet glen, where my foolish heart was dwelling. Notwithstanding doubts of right, notwithstanding sense of duty, and despite all manly striving, and the great love of my home, there my heart was ever dwelling, knowing what a fool it was, and content to know it. Many birds came twittering round me in the gold of August. Many trees showed twinkling beauty as the sun went lower, and the lines of water fell from wrinkles into dimples. Little heeding, there I crouched, though with sense of everything that afterwards should move me, like a picture or a dream, and everything went by me softly while my heart was gazing. At last a little figure came, not insignificant, I mean, but looking very light and slender in the moving shadows, gently here and softly there, as if vague of purpose, with a gloss of tender movement, in and out the wealth of trees and liberty of the meadow. Who was I to crouch or doubt or look at her from a distance? What matter if they killed me now, and one tear came to bury me? Therefore I rushed out at once, as if shotguns were unknown yet, not from any real courage, but from prisoned love burst forth. I know not whether my own Lorna was afraid of what I looked, or what I might say to her, or of her own thoughts of me. All I know is that she looked frightened, when I hoped for gladness. Perhaps the power of my joy was more than maiden liked to own, or in any way to answer to, and to tell the truth it seemed as if I might now forget myself, while she would take good care of it. This makes a man grow thoughtful, unless, as some low fellows do, he believe all women hypocrites. Therefore I went slowly towards her, taken back in my impulse, and said all I could come to say, with some distress in doing it. Mistress Lorna, I had hoped that you were in need of me. Oh, yes, but that was long ago, two months ago or more, sir. And saying this she looked away, as if it all were over. But I was now so dazed and frightened that it took my breath away, and I could not answer, feeling sure that I was robbed and some one else had won her, and I tried to turn away, without another word, and go. But I could not help one stupid sob, though mad with myself for allowing it, but it came too sharp for pride to stay it, and it told a world of things. Lorna heard it and ran to me, with her bright eyes full of wonder, pity, and great kindness, as if amazed that I had more than a simple liking for her. Then she held out both hands to me, and I took and looked at them. "'Master Ridd, I did not mean,' she whispered very softly, 
I did not mean to vex you. "'If you would be loath to vex me, none else in this world can do it,' I answered out of my great love, but fearing yet to look at her, mine eyes not being strong enough. "'Come away from this bright place,' she answered, trembling in her turn. "'I am watched and spied of late. Come beneath the shadows, John.' I would have leaped into the valley of the shadow of death, as described by the late John Bunyan, only to hear her call me John, though Apollyon were lurking there and despair should lock me in. She stole across the silent grass, but I strode hotly after her. Fear was all beyond me now, except the fear of losing her. I could not but behold her manner as she went before me, all her grace and lovely sweetness and her sense of what she was. She led me to her own rich bower, which I told of once before, and if in spring it were a sight, what was it in summer glory? But although my mind had notice of its fairness and its wonder, not a heed my heart took of it, neither dwelt it in my presence more than flowing water. All that in my presence dwelt, all that in my heart was felt, was the maiden moving gently, and afraid to look at me. For now the power of my love was abiding on her, new to her, unknown to her, not a thing to speak about, nor even to think clearly, only just to feel and wonder, with a pain of sweetness. She could look at me no more, neither could she look away, with a studied manner, only to let fall her eyes, and blush, and be put out with me, and still more with herself. I left her quite alone, though close, though tingling to have hold of her. Even her right hand was dropped and lay among the mosses. Neither did I try to steal one glimpse below her eyelids. Life and death to me were hanging on the first glance I should win, yet I let it be so. After long or short, I know not, yet ere I was weary, ere I yet began to think or wish for any answer, Lorna slowly raised her eyelids, with a gleam of dew below them, and looked at me doubtfully. Any look with so much in it never met my gaze before. "'Darling, do you love me?' was all that I could say to her. "'Yes, I like you very much,' she answered, with her eyes gone from me and her dark hair falling over, so as not to show me things. "'But do you love me, Lorna? Lorna, do you love me more than all the world?' "'No, to be sure not. Now why should I?' "'In truth I know not why you should. Only I hope that you did, Lorna. Either love me not at all, or as I love you for ever.' "'John, I love you very much, and I would not grieve you. You are the bravest and the kindest and the simplest of all men, I mean of all people.' I like you very much, Master Ridd, and I think of you almost every day. That will not do for me, Lorna. Not almost every day, I think, but every instant of my life, of you. For you I would give up my home, my love of all the world beside, my duty to my dearest ones. For you I would give up my life, and hope of life beyond it. Do you love me so? Not by any means, said Lorna. No, I like you very much, when you do not talk so wildly, and I like to see you come as if you would fill our valley up, and I like to think that even Carver would be nothing in your hands, but as to liking you like that, what should make it likely? Especially when I have made this signal, and for some two months or more you have never even answered it. If you like me so ferociously, why do you leave me for other people to do just as they like with me? To do as they liked? "'Oh, Lorna, not to make you marry Carver!' "'No, Master Ridd, be not frightened so. It makes me fear to look at you.' "'But you have not married Carver yet. Say, quick, why keep me waiting so?' "'Of course I have not, Master Ridd. Should I be here if I had, think you, and allowing you to like me so, and to hold my hand, and make me laugh, as I declare you almost do sometimes, and at other times you frighten me?' "'Did they want you to marry Carver? Tell me all the truth of it.' "'Not yet, not yet. They are not half so impetuous as you are, John. I am only just seventeen, you know, and who is to think of marrying? 
but they wanted me to give my word and be formally betrothed to him in the presence of my grandfather. It seems that something frightened them. There is a youth named Charleworth Doone, everyone calls him Charlie, a headstrong and a gay young man, very gallant in his looks and manner, and my uncle, the counsellor, chose to fancy that Charlie looked at me too much, coming by my grandfather's cottage. Here Lorna blushed so that I was frightened, and began to hate this Charlie more, a great deal more, than even Carver Doone. "'He had better not,' said I. "'I will fling him over it if he dare. He shall see thee through the roof, Lorna, if at all he see thee.' "'Master Ridd, you are worse than Carver. I thought you were so kind-hearted. Well, they wanted me to promise, and even to swear a solemn oath, a thing I have never done in my life, that I would wed my eldest cousin, this same Carver Doone, who is twice as old as I am, being thirty-five and upwards. That was why I gave the token that I wished to see you, Master Ridd. They pointed out how much it was for the peace of all the family, and for mine own benefit, but I would not listen for a moment, though the counsellor was most eloquent, and my grandfather begged me to consider, and Carver smiled his pleasantest, which is a truly frightful thing. Then both he and his crafty father were for using force with me, but Sir Ensor would not hear of it, and they have put off that extreme until he shall be past its knowledge, or at least beyond preventing it. And now I am watched and spied and followed, and half my little liberty seems to be taken from me. I could not be here speaking with you, even in my own nook and refuge, but for the aid and skill and courage of dear little Gwenny Carfax. She is now my chief reliance, and through her alone I hope to baffle all my enemies, since others have forsaken me. Tears of sorrow and reproach were lurking in her soft dark eyes, until in fewest words I told her that my seeming negligence was nothing but my bitter loss and wretched absence far away, of which I had so vainly striven to give any tidings without danger to her. When she heard all this, and saw what I had brought from London, which was nothing less than a ring of pearls with a sapphire in the midst of them, as pretty as could well be found, she let the gentle tears flow fast, and came and sat so close beside me that I trembled like a folded sheep at the bleeding of her lamb. But recovering comfort quickly, without more ado, I raised her left hand and observed it with a nice regard, wondering at the small blue veins and curves and tapering whiteness and the points it finished with. My wonder seemed to please her much, herself so well accustomed to it, and not fond of watching it. And then, before she could say a word, or guess what I was up to, as quick as ever I turned hand in a bout of wrestling, on her finger was my ring, sapphire for the veins of blue, and pearls to match white fingers. "'Oh, you crafty Master Ridd,' said Lorna, looking up at me, and blushing now a far brighter blush than when she spoke of Charlie. I thought you were much too simple ever to do this sort of thing. No wonder you can catch the fish, as when first I saw you. Have I caught you, little fish? Or must all my life be spent in hopeless angling for you? Neither one nor the other, John. You have not caught me yet altogether, though I like you dearly, John, and if you will only keep away, I shall like you more and more. As for hopeless angling, John, that all others shall have until I tell you otherwise. With the large tears in her eyes, tears which seemed to me to rise partly from her want to love me with the power of my love, she put her pure bright lips, half smiling, half prone to reply to tears, against my forehead lined with trouble, doubt, and eager longing. And then she drew my ring from off that snowy twig her finger, and held it out to me, and then, seeing how my face was falling, thrice she touched it with her lips, and sweetly gave it back to me. "'John, I dare not take it now, else I should be cheating you. I will try to love you dearly, even as you deserve and wish. Keep it for me just till then. Something tells me I shall earn it in a very little time. Perhaps you will be sorry then, sorry when it is all too late, 
to be loved by such as I am. What could I do at her mournful tone but kiss a thousand times the hand which she put up to warn me, and vow that I would rather die with one assurance of her love than without it live forever with all beside that the world could give? Upon this she looked so lovely, with her dark eyelashes trembling, and her soft eyes full of light, and the color of clear sunrise mounting on her cheeks and brow, that I was forced to turn away, being overcome with beauty. "'Dearest darling, love of my life,' I whispered through her clouds of hair, "'how long must I wait to know, how long must I linger, doubting whether you can ever stoop from your birth and wondrous beauty to a poor, coarse hind like me, an ignorant, unlettered yeoman?' "'I will not have you revile yourself,' said Lorna very tenderly, just as I had meant to make her. "'You are not rude and unlettered, John. You know a great deal more than I do. You have learned both Greek and Latin, as you told me long ago, and you have been at the very best school in the west of England. None of us but my grandfather, and the counsellor, who is a great scholar, can compare with you in this. And though I have laughed at your manner of speech, I only laughed in fun, John. I never meant to vex you by it, nor knew that it had done so. "'Not, you say, can vex me, dear,' I answered, as she leaned towards me in her generous sorrow. "'Unless you say, Be gone, John Ridd, I love another more than you.' "'Then I shall never vex you, John. Never, I mean, by saying that. Now, John, if you please, be quiet.' for I was carried away so much by hearing her calling me John so often, and the music of her voice, and the way she bent toward me, and the shadow of soft weeping in the sunlight of her eyes, that some of my great hand was creeping in a manner not to be imagined, and far less explained, toward the lithesome, wholesome curving underneath her mantle-fold, and out of sight and harm, as I thought, not being her front waist, However, I was dashed with that, and pretended not to mean it, only to pluck some lady-fern, whose elegance did me no good. "'Now, John,' said Lorna, being so quick that not even a lover could cheat her, and observing my confusion more intently than she need have done, "'Master John Ridd, it is high time for you to go home to your mother. I love your mother very much from what you have told me about her, and I will not have her cheated.' "'If you truly love my mother,' said I, very craftily, "'the only way to show it is by truly loving me.' Upon that she laughed at me in the sweetest manner, and with such provoking ways, and such come-and-go of glances, and beginning of quick blushes, which she tried to laugh away, that I knew, as well as if she herself had told me, by some knowledge, void of reasoning and the surer for it, I knew quite well— while all my heart was burning hot within me, and mine eyes were shy of hers, and her eyes were shy of mine, for certain and for ever this I knew, as in a glory, that Lorna Doone had now begun, and would go on to love me. End of chapter 28 Recording by Michelle Harris of Lorna Dune. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daisy 55. Lorna Dune by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter 29. Reaping Leads to Reveling. Although I was under interdict for two months for my darling, one for your sake, one for mine, she had whispered with her head withdrawn, yet not so very far from me. Lighter heart was not on Exmoor than I bore for half the time, and even for three quarters. For she was safe, I knew that daily by a mode of signals, well contrived between us now on the strength of our experience. I have nothing now to fear, John, she has said to me as we parted. 
it is true that I am spied and watched, but Gwenny is too keen for them. While I have my grandfather to prevent all violence, and little Gwenny to keep watch on those who try to watch me, and you, above all others, John, ready at a moment, if the worst comes to the worst. This neglected Lorna Doom was never in such case before. Therefore, do not squeeze my hand, John. I am safe without it, and you do not know your strength. Ah, I knew my strength right well. Hill and valley scarcely seemed to be step and landing for me. Fiercest cattle I will play with, making them go backward and afraid of hurting them, like John Fry with his terrier. Even rooted trees seemed to me but as sticks I could smite down, except for my love of everything. The love of all things was upon me, and a softness to them, and a sense of having something, even such as they had. Then the golden harvest came, waving on the broad hillside, and nestling in the quiet nooks scooped from out the fringe of wood. A wealth of harvest such as never gladdened all our countryside since my father ceased to reap, and his sickle hung to rust. There had not been a man on Exmoor fit to work that reaping hook since the time its owner fell, in the prime of life and strength, before a sterner reaper. But now I took it from the wall where mother proudly stored it, while she watched me, hardly knowing whether she should smile or cry. All the parish was assembled in our upper courtyard, for we were to open the harvest that year. As had been settled with Farmer Nicholas and with Jasper Keeby, who held the third or little farm. We started in proper order, therefore, as our practice is, first the parson Joshua Bowden, wearing his gown and cassock with the Paris Bible in his hand, and a sickle strapped behind him. As we strolled along well and stoutly, being a man in substance, all of our family came next. I leading mother with one hand, in the other bearing my father's hook, and with a loaf of our own bread and a keg of cider upon my back. Behind us Annie and Lizzie walked, wearing wreaths of corn flowers set out very prettily, such as mother would have worn if she had been a farmer's wife instead of a farmer's widow. Being as she was, she had no adornment except that her widow's hood was off and her hair allowed to flow as if she had been a maiden, and very rich bright hair it was in spite of all her troubles. After us, the maidens came milkmaids and the rest of them with Betty Muxworthy at their head, scolding even now because they would not walk fifthly. But they only laughed at her, and she knew it was no good to scold with all the men behind them. Then the snows came trooping forward, Farmer Nicholas in the middle, walking as if he would rather walk to a wheat field of his own, yet content to follow lead because he knew himself the leader, and signing every now and then to the people here and there, as if I were nobody. But to see his three great daughters, strong and handsome wenches, making upon either side, as if somebody would run off with them, this was the very thing that taught me how to value Lorna and her pure simplicity. After the snows came, Jasper Keeby and his wife, new married, and a very honest pair they were, upon only a hundred acres and a right of common. After these the men came hotly, without decent order, 
trying to spy the girls in front and make good jokes about them at which their wives laughed heartily being jealous when alone perhaps and after these men and their wives came all the children toddling picking flowers by the way and chattering and asking questions as the children will there must have been three score of us take one with another and the lane was full of people when we were come to the big field gate where the first sickle was to be parson bowden heaved up the rail with the sleeves of his gown done green with it and he said that everybody might hear him though his breath was short in the name of the lord amen amen so be it cried the clerk who was far behind being only a shoemaker then parson bowden read some verses from the parish bible telling us to lift up our eyes and look upon the fields already white to harvest and then he laid the bible down on the square head of the gate post and despite his gown and cassock three good swipes he cut off corn and laid them right in onwards all this time the rest was huddling outside the gate and along the lane not daring to interfere with parson but whispering how well he did it when he had stowed the corn like that mother entered leaning on me and we both said thank the lord for all his mercies and these the first fruits of his hand and then the clerk gave out a psalm verse by verse done very well although he sneezed in the midst of it from a beard of wheat thrust up his nose by the rival cobbler at breeden and when the psalm was sung so strongly that the foxgloves on the bank were shaken like a chime of bells at it parson took a stoop of cider and we all fell to at reaping of course i mean the men not women although i know that up the country women are allowed to reap and right well they reap it keeping row for row with men calmly and in due order yet me seems the men must ill attend to their own reaping hooks in fear lest the other cut themselves being the weaker vessel but in our part women do what seems their proper business following well behind the men out of harm of the swinging hook and stooping with their breast and arms up they catch the swatches of corn where the reapers cast them and tucking them tightly together with a wisp laid under them this they fetch around and twist with a knee to keep it closed and lo there is godly sheaf ready to set up in stooks after these the children come gathering each for his little self if the farmer be right-minded until each hath a bundle made as big as himself and longer and tumbles now and again with it in the deeper part of the stubble we the men keep marching onwards down the flank of the yellow wall with knees bent wide and left arm bowed and right arm flashing steel each man in his several place keeping down the rig or chime on the right side of the reaper in front and the left of the man that followed him each making farther sweep and inroad into the golden breadth and depth each casting leftwards his rich clearance on his foregoers double track so like half a wedge of wild fowl to and fro we swept the field and when to either hedge we came sickles wanted wetting and throats required moisturing and backs were in need of easing and every man had much to say and woman wanted praising then all returned to the other end with reaping hooks beneath our arms and dogs left to mine jackets but now will you believe me well or will you only laugh at me for even in a world of wheat when deep among the varnished crisp, crispness of the jointed stalks 
and below the feather yielding of the graceful heads, even as I gripped the swatches and swept the sickle around them, even as I flung them by to rest on brother stubble, through the whirling yellow world, an eagerness of reaping came the vision of my love as with downcast eyes she wandered at my power of passion. And then the sweet remembrance glowed brighter than the sun through wheat, through my very depth of heart, of how she raised those beaming eyes and ripened in my breast rich hope. Even now I could descry, like high waves in the distance, the rounded heads and folded shadows of the wood of Bagworthy. Perhaps she was walking in the valley and softly gazing up at them. Oh, to be a bird just there, I could see a bright mist hanging just above the doomed glen. Perhaps it was shedding its drizzle upon her. Oh, to be a drop of rain. The very breeze which bowed the harvest to my bosom gently might have come direct from Lorna with her sweet voice laden. All the flaws of air that wandered where they will around her, fan her bright cheek, play with lashes, even revel in her hair, and reveal her beauties. Man is but a breath, we know, would I were such breath as that. But confound it, I pondered, with delicious dreams suspended, with my right arm hanging frustrate, and the John sickle drooped, with my left arm bowed for clasping something more germane than wheat, and my eyes not minding business, but intent on distant woods, confounded, what are the men about, and why am I left vaporing? They have taken advantage of me, the rogues. They are gone to the hedge for the sight of jars. They have had up the sled of bread and meat, quite softly over the stubble, and if I can believe my eyes, so dazed with Lorna's image. They are sitting down to an excellent dinner before the church clock has gone eleven. John Fry, you big villain, I cried, with John hanging up in the air by the scruff of his neck cloth, but holding still by his knife and fork and a goose leg in between his lips. John Fry, what mean you by this, sir? Let me down, or I can't tell ee, John answered with some difficulty. So I let him come down, and I must confess that he had reason on his side. Plays your worship, John called me so, ever since I returned from London, firmly believing that the king had made me a magistrate at least, though I was to keep it secret. As it as how you worship will took thinking of king's business in the middle of white rig and so as the lat un come to a zale us had better say time by taking a dinner and here us be praise your worship and hops no offence with thick iron spoon full of vile tatties i was glad enough to accept the ladle full of fried potatoes and to make the best of things which is generally done by letting men have their own way. Therefore, I managed to dine with them, although it was so early. For according to all that I can find in a long life and a varied one, twelve o'clock is the real time for a man to have his dinner. Then the sun is at his noon, calling halt to look around, and then the plants and leaves are turning, each with a little leisure time before the work of the afternoon. Then is the balance of east and west, and then the right and left side of a man are in due proportion, 
and contribute fairly with harmonious fluids and the health of this mode of life and its reclaiming virtue are well set forth in our ancient rhyme sunrise breakfast sun high dinner sundown sup makes a saint of a sinner wish the wheat falls whirl again ye have had good dinners give your master and mistress plenty to supply another and in truth we did reap well and fairly through the whole of that afternoon i not only keeping lead but keeping the men up to it we got through a matter of ten acres ere the sun between the shocks broke his light on wheaten plums then hung his red cloak on the clouds and fell into gray slumber seeing this we wiped our sickles and our breasts and foreheads and soon were on a homeward road looking forward to good supper of course all the reapers came at night to the harvest supper and parson bolden to say the grace as well as to help to call for us and some help was needed there i can well assure you for the reapers had brave appetites and most of their wives having babies were forced to eat as a duty neither failed they of this duty cut and come again was the order of the evening as it had been of the day and i had no time to ask questions but help meat and lotto gravy all the while our darling annie with her sleeves tucked up and her comely figure panting was running about with a bucket of tatties mashed with lard and cabbage even lizzie had left her books and was serving out beer and cider while mother helped plum pudding largely on pewter plates with the mutton and all the time betty muxworthy was grunting in and out everywhere not having space to scold even but changing the dishes serving the meat poking the fire and cooking more but john fry would not stir a peg except with his knife and fork having all the airs of a visitor and his wife to keep him eating till i thought there would be no end of it then having eaten all they could they prepared themselves with one accord for the business now of drinking but first they lifted the neck of corn dressed with ribbons gaily and set it upon the mantelpiece each man with his horn of froth and then they sang a song about it every one shouting in the chorus louder than a harvest thunderstorm some were in the middle of one verse and some at the end of the next one yet somehow all managed to get together in the mighty roar of the burden and if any farmer up the country would like to know exmoor harvest song as sung in my time and will be sung long after i am gone at home lo here i set it down for him admitting only the dialect which perchance might puzzle him exmoor harvest song the corn oh the corn tis the ripen of the corn go unto the door my lad and look beneath the moon thou canst see beyond the wood rick how it is yellowing tis the harvest in the wheat and the barley must be shown the corn oh the corn and the yellow mellow corn here's to the corn with the cups upon the board we've been reaping all the day and we'll reap again the morn and fetch it home to-morrow yard and then we'll thank the lord the wheat oh the wheat tis the ripen of the wheat all the day it has been hanging down its heavy head bowing over on our bosom with a beard of red tis the harvest and the value makes the labor sweet the wheat oh the wheat and the golden golden wheat 
Here's to the wheat with the loaves upon the board. We've been ripping all the day and will never be beat. But fetch it all to morrow yard and then we'll thank the Lord. The barley, oh, the barley, and the barley is in prime. All the date has been rustling with its bristles brown, waiting with its beard a-bowing till it can be mowed. Tis the harvest and the barley must abide its time. The barley, oh, the barley, and the barley ruddle brown. Here's to the barley with the beard upon the board. We'll go a-mowing soon as ever all the wheat is down. When all is in the mower yard, we'll stop and thank the Lord. The oats, oh, the oats, till the ripening of the oats. All the day they have been dancing with their flakes of white, waiting for the grilling hook to be the nag's delight. Tis the harvest, let them dangle in their skirted coats. The oats, oh, the oats, and the silver, silver oats. Here's to the oats with the black stone on the board. We'll go among them when the barley has been laid in ropes. When all is home to morrow yard, we'll kneel and thank the Lord. The corn, oh the corn, and the blessing of the corn. Come unto the door, my lads, and look beneath the moon. We can see on hill and valley how it is yellowed, with a breath of glory as when our Lord was born. The corn, oh, the corn, and the yellow, yellow corn. Thanks for the corn, with our bread upon the board. So shall we acknowledge it, before we reap the morn, with our hands to heaven, and our knees unto the Lord. Now we sang this song very well the first time, having the parish choir to lead us, and the clarinet, and the parson to give us the time with his cup and we sang it again the second time but not so but what you might praise it if you had been with us all the evening although the parson was gone then and the clerk was not fit to compare with him in the matter of keeping time but when that song was in his third singing i defy any man however sober to have made out one verse from the other, or even the burden from the verses, inasmuch as every man present, a and woman too, sang as became convenient to them, in utterance both of words and tune. And in truth, there was much excuse for them, because it was a noble harvest, fit to thank the Lord for, without his thinking us hypocrites for we had more land and wheat that year than ever we had before and twice the crop to the acre and i could not help now and then remembering in the midst of the merriment how my father in the churchyard yonder would have gloried to behold it and my mother who had left us now happening to return just then, being called to have her health drunk, for the twentieth time at least, I knew by the sadness in her eyes that she was thinking just as I was. Presently, therefore, I slipped away from the noise and myrrh and smoking, although of that last there was not much except from Farmer Nicholas, and crossing the courtyard in the moonlight, I went, just to cool myself, as far as my father's tombstone. End of chapter 29 Recording by Daisy 55all LibreVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibreVox.org. Recording by Daisy55 Lorna Dune by Aura D. Blackmore Chapter 30 Annie Gets the Best of It I had long outgrown unwholesome feelings as to my father's death 
and so had Annie, though Lizzie, who must have loved him least, still entertained some evil will and longing for a punishment. Therefore I was surprised, and indeed startled would not be too much to say the moon being somewhat fleecy, to see our Annie sitting there as motionless as the tombstone, and with all her best fallers upon her, after stowing away of the dishes. My nerves, however, are good and strong, except at least in love matters, wherein they always fail me, and when I meet with witches, and therefore I went up to Annie, although she looked so white and pure, for I had seen her before with those things on, and this struck me who she was. What are you doing here, Annie? I inquired rather sternly, being vexed with her for having gone so very near to frighten me. Nothing at all, said I, Annie, shortly, and indeed it was truth enough for a woman. Not that I dare to believe that women are such liars as men, say, only that I mean they often see things round the corner and know not which is which of it. And indeed, I never have known a woman, though right enough in their meaning, purely and perfectly true and transparent, except only my Lorna, and even so, I might not have loved her if she had been ugly. Why, how so, I said, Miss Annie. What business have you here, doing nothing at this time of night and leaving me with all the troubles to entertain our guests? You seem not to be doing it, John, answered Annie softly. What business have you here doing nothing at this time of night? I was taken so aback with this, and the extreme impertinence of it, from a mere young girl like Annie, that I turned round to march away and have nothing more to say to her. But she jumped up and caught me by the hand and threw herself upon my bosom with her face all wet with tears. Oh, John, I will tell you, I will tell you, only don't be angry, John. Angry? No, indeed, I said. What right have I to be angry with you? Because you have your secrets? Every chick of a girl thinks now that she has a right to her secrets. And you have none of your own, John? Of course you have none of your own. Or you're going on out at night? We will not quarrel here, poor Annie, I answered with some loftiness. There are many things upon my mind which girls can have no notion of. And so there are upon mine, John. Oh, John, I will tell you everything if you will look at me kindly and promise to forgive me. Oh, I am so miserable. Now this, though she was behaving so badly, moved me much towards her, especially as I longed to know what she had to tell me. Therefore, I allowed her to coax me and to kiss me and to lead me away a little as far as the old yew tree, for she would not tell me where she was. But even in the shadow there, she was very long before beginning and seemed to have two minds about it, or rather perhaps a dozen. And she laid her cheek against the tree and sobbed till it was pitiful, and I knew what mother would say to her for spoiling her best frock so. Now will you stop, I said at last, harder than I meant it, for I knew that she would go on all night. If anyone encouraged her, and though not well acquainted with women, I understood my sisters, or else I must be a born fool, except, of course, that I never professed to understand Eliza. Yes, I will stop, said Annie, panting. You are very hard on me, John, but I know you mean it for the best. If somebody else, I am sure, don't know who, and have no right to know, no doubt, but she must be a wicked thing if somebody else had been taken so with a pain all round the heart, John, 
and no power of telling it. Perhaps you would have coaxed and kissed her and come a little nearer and made opportunity to be very loving. Now this was so exactly what I had tried to do to Lorna that my breath was almost taken away at Annie's so describing it. For a while I could not say a word but wonder if she were a witch which had never been in our family. Then, all of a sudden, I saw the way to beat her, with the devil at my elbow. From your knowledge of these things, Annie, you must have had them done to you. I demand to know this very moment who has taken such liberties. Then, John, you shall never know if you ask in that manner. Besides, it was no liberty in the least at all. Cousins have a right to do things, and when they are one's godfather. Here Annie stopped quite suddenly, having so betrayed herself, but met me in the full moonlight, being resolved to face it out with a good face put upon it. Alas, I feared it would come to this, I answered very sadly. I know he has been here many a time without showing himself to me. There is nothing meaner than for a man to sneak and to steal a young maid's heart without her people knowing it. You are not doing anything of that sort yourself then, dear John, are you? Only a common highway man, I answered, without heeding her, a man without an acre of his own and liable to hang upon any common and no other writer coming over it. John, said my sister, are the dunes privileged not to be hanged upon common land? At this I was so thunderstruck that I leaped in the air like a shot rabbit and rushed as hard as I could through the gate and across the yard and back into the kitchen and there I asked Farmer Nicholas Snow to give me some tobacco and to lend me a spare pipe. This he did with a grateful manner, being now some five-fourths gone, and so I smoked the very first pipe that ever had entered my lips till then, and beyond a doubt it did me good, and spread my heart at leisure. Meanwhile, the reapers were mostly gone, to be up betimes in the morning, and some were led by their wives, and some had to lead their wives themselves, according to the capacity of man and wife respectfully. But Betty was as lively as ever, bustling about with every one and looking out for the chance of groats, which the better off might be free with. And over the kneeling pan next day, she dropped three and six pence out of her pocket, and Lizzie could not tell for her life how much more might have it been. Now by this time I had almost finished smoking that pipe of tobacco and wondering at myself for having so despised it head to hole and to making up my mind to have another trial tomorrow night. It began to occur to me that although dear Annie had behaved so very badly and rudely and almost taken my breath away with the suddenness of her illusion, Yet it was not kind of me to leave her out there at that time of night, all alone and in such distress. Any of the reapers going home might be forgotten, so far beyond fear of ghosts, as to venture into the churchyard, and although they would know a great deal better than to insult a sister of mine when sober, there was no telling what they might do in their present state of rejoicing. Moreover, it was only right that I should learn, from Lorna's sake, how far Annie, or anyone else, had penetrated our secret. Therefore, I went forth at once, bearing my pipe in a skillful manner, as I had seen Farmer Nicholas do, and marking with a new kind of pleasure how the rings and wreaths of smoke hovered and fluttered in the moonlight like a lock upon his carol. Poor Annie was gone back again to our father's grave, 
and there she sat upon the turf, sobbing very gently and not wishing to trouble any one. So I raised her tenderly and made much of her and consoled her, for I could not scold her there, and perhaps, after all, she was not to be blamed so much as Tom Fagus himself was. Annie was very grateful to me and kissed me many times and begged my pardon ever so often for her rudeness to me. And then having gone so far with it and finding me so complacent, she must needs try to go a little further and to lead me away from her own affairs and into mine concerning Lorna. But although it was clever enough of her, she was not deep enough for me there, and I soon discovered that she knew nothing, not even the name of my darling, but only suspected from things she had seen and put together like a woman. Upon this, I brought her back again to Tom Fagus and his doings. My poor Annie, have you really promised him to be his wife? Then, after all, you have no reason, John, no particular reason, I mean, for slighting poor Sally Snow so. Without even asking mother or me, oh, Annie, it was wrong of you. But darling, you know what mother wish, wishes you so much to marry Sally, and I am sure you could have her tomorrow. She dotes on the very ground. I dare say he tells you that, Annie, that he dotes on the ground you walk upon. But did you believe him, child? You may believe me, I assure you, John, and half the farm to be settled upon her after the old man's time. And though she gives herself little airs, it is only done to entice you. She has the very best hand in the dairy, John, and the lightest at a turnover cake. Now, Annie, don't talk nonsense so. I wish just to know the truth about you and Tom Fagus. Do you mean to marry him? I to marry before my brother and leave him with none to take care of him? Who can do him a red deer collar except Sally herself, as I can? Come home, dear ones, and I will do you one for you never ate a morsel of supper with all the people you had to attend upon. This was true enough, and seeing no chance of anything more than cross questions and crooked purposes at which a girl was sure to beat me, I even allowed her to lead me home with the thoughts of the call up uppermost, but I never counted upon being beaten so thoroughly as I was. For knowing me now to be off my guard, the young hussy stopped at the farm gate yard, as if with a rare entangling her, and while I was stooping to take it away, she looked me full in the face by the moonlight and jerked out quite suddenly. Can your love do a collar, John? No. I should hope not, I answered rashly. She is not a mere cook maid, I should hope not. She is not half so pretty as Sally Snow. I will answer for that, said Annie. She is ten thousand times as pretty as ten thousand Sally Snows, I replied with great indignation. Oh, but look at Sally's eyes, cried my sister rapturously. Look at Lorna Dunes, said I, and you will never look again at Sally's. Oh, Lorna Doon, Lorna Doon, exclaimed our Annie, half frightened, yet clapping her hands with triumph at having found me out so. Lorna Doon is the lovely maiden who has stolen poor somebody's heart so. Ah, oh, I shall remember it because it is so queer a name. But stop. I had better write it down. Lend me your hat for a boy to write it on. I have a great mind to lend you a box on the ear, I answered her in my vexation. And I would, if you had not been crying so, you sly good-for-nothing baggage. As it is, 
I shall keep it for Master Fagus, and add interest for keeping. Oh, no, John. Oh, no, John. She begged me earnestly, being sobered in a moment. Your hand is so terribly heavy, John, and he never would forgive you. Although he is so good-hearted, he cannot put up with an insult. Promise me, dear John, that you will not strike him, and I will promise you faithfully to keep your secret, even from mother, and even from cousin Tom himself. And from Lizzie, most of all from Lizzie, I answered very eagerly, knowing too well which of my relations would be hardest on me. Of course from little Lizzie, said Annie, with some contempt. A young thing like her cannot be kept too long, in my opinion, from the knowledge of such subjects. And besides, I should be very sorry if Lizzie had the right to know your secrets, as I have, dearest John. Not a soul shall be the wiser for your having trusted me, John. Although I shall be very wretched when you are late away at night, among those dreadful people. Well, I replied, it is no use crying over spilled milk, Annie. You have my secret, and I have yours, and I scarcely know which of the two is likely to have the worst time of it when it comes to mother's ears. I could put up with perpetual scolding, but not with mother's sad silence. That is exactly how I feel, John. And as Annie said, she brightened up, and her soft eyes shone upon me. But now I shall be much happier, dear, because I shall try to help you. No doubt the young lady deserves it, John. She is not after the farm, I hope. She exclaimed, and that was enough. There was so much scorn in my voice and face. Then I am sure, I am very glad, Annie always made the best of things. For I do believe that Sally Snow has taken a fancy to our dairy place and the pattern of our cream pans, and she asked so much of our metals and the color of the milk. Then, after all, you were right, dear Annie. It is the ground she dotes upon and the things that walk upon it, she answered me with another kiss. Sally has taken a wonderful fancy to our best cow, Nipple Pins. But she never shall have her now. What a consolation. We entered the house quite gently thus, and found Farmer Nicholas Snow asleep, little dreaming how his plans had been overset between us, and then Annie said to me, very slyly, between a smile and a blush, Don't you wish Lorna Doone was here, John, in the parlor along with Mother, instead of those two fashionable milkmaids, as Uncle Ben will call them, and poor, stupid Mistress Kibby? That indeed I do, Annie. I must kiss you for only thinking of it. Dear me, it seems as if you had known all about us for a twelfth month. She loves you with all her heart, John. No doubt about that, of course. And Annie looked up at me as much as to say she would like to know who could help it. That's the very thing she won't do, I said, knowing that Annie would love me all the more for it. She is only beginning to like me, Annie, and as for loving... She is so young that she only loves her grandfather, but I hope she will come to it by and by. Of course, she must, replied my sister. It will be impossible for her to help it. Ah, oh, well, I don't know, for I wanted more assurance of it. Maidens are such wondrous things. Not a bit of it, said Annie, casting her eyes downwards. Love is as simple as milking, when people know how to do it. But you must not let her alone too long. That is my advice to you. What a simpleton you must have been not to tell me long ago. 
it would have made Lorna wild about you, long before this time, Johnny. But now you go into the parlor, dear, while I do your call-up. Faith Snow is not come, but Polly and Sally. Sally has made up her mind to call for you this very blessed evening, John. Only look what a thing of a scarf she has on. I should be quite ashamed to wear it. But you won't strike poor Tom, will you? Not I, my darling, for your sweet sake. And so dear Annie, having grown quite brave, gave me a little push into the parlor, where I was quite abashed to enter after all I had heard about Sally, and I made up my mind to examine her well and to try a little courting with her, if she should lead me on, that I may be in practice for Lorna. But when I perceived how grandly and richly both the young damsels were apparelled, and how in their curtsies to me they retreated as if I were making it up to them, in a way they had learned from Exeter, and how they began to talk of the court as if they had been there all their lives, and the latest mode of the Duchess of this, and the profile of the Countess of that, and the last good saying of my Lord something, instead of butter and cream and eggs and things which they understood. I knew there must be somebody in the room besides Jasper Kebby to talk at. And so there was, for behind the curtain drawn across the window seat, no less a man than Uncle Ben was sitting half asleep and weary, and by his side a little girl very quiet and very watchful. My mother led me to Uncle Ben, and he took my hand without rising, muttering something not over polite about my being bigger than ever. I asked him heartily how he was, and he said, Well enough for that matter, but none the better for the noise you great claws have been making. I am sorry that we have disturbed you, sir, I answered civilly, but I knew not that you were here even and you must allow for harvest time. So it seems, he replied, and allow a great deal, including waste and drunkenness. Now, if you can see so small a thing after an empty and flag as much longer, this is my granddaughter and my Harris. Here he glanced at my mother, my Harris, little Ruth Huckleback. I am very glad to see you, Ruth, I answered offering my hand, which she seemed afraid to take. Welcome to Plowers Borrows, my good cousin Ruth. However, my good cousin Ruth only arose and made me a curtsy, and lifted her great brown eyes at me, more in fear, as I thought, than kinship. And if ever any one looked unlike the Harris to great property, it was the little girl before me. Come out to the kitchen, dear, and let me chuck you to the ceiling, I said, just to encourage her. I always do it to little girls, and then they can see the hams and bacon. But Uncle Reuben burst out laughing, and Ruth turned away with a deep, rich color. Do you know how old she is, you numbskull, said Uncle Ben in his driest draw. She was seventeen last July, sir. On the first of July, Grandfather, Ruth whispered, with her back still to me, but many people will not believe it. Here Mother came up to my rescue, as she always loved to do, and she said, If my son may not dance Miss Ruth, at any rate he may dance with her. We have only been waiting for you, dear John, to have a little harvest dance with the kitchen door thrown open. You take Ruth, Uncle Ben takes Sally, Master Deby pair off with Polly, and neighbor Nicholas will be good enough, if I can awake him, to stand up with fair Mistress Keeby. Lizzie will play us the virginal, won't you, Lizzie, dear? But who is to dance with you, madam? 
Uncle Ben asked very politely. I think you must rearrange your figure. I have not danced for a score of years, and I will not dance now, while the mistress and the owner of the harvest sits aside neglected. Nay, Master Huckleback, cried Sally Snow, with a saucy toss of her hair. Mistress Red is too kind a great deal in handling you over to me. You take her, and I will fetch Annie to be my partner this evening. I like dancing very much better with girls, for they never squeeze and rumple one. Oh, it is so much nicer. Have no fear for me, my dears, my mother answered, smiling. Parson Bowden promised to come back again. I expect him every minute, and he intends to lead me off and to bring a partner for Annie, too. A very pretty young gentleman. Now begin, and I will join you. There was no disobeying her without rudeness, and indeed the girl's feet were already jiggling, and Lizzie giving herself wonderful airs with a roll of learned music, and even while Annie was doing my call-up, her pretty round instep was arching itself as I could see from the parlor door. So I took little Ruth, and I spun her around as the sound of the music came lively and ringing, and after us came all the rest with much laughter, begging me not to jump over her, and anon my grave partner began to smile sweetly and look up at me with the brightest of eyes and drop me the prettiest curtsy till I thought what a great stoop I must have been to dream of putting her in the cheese rack. But one thing I could not at all understand, why mother, who used to do all in her power to throw me across Sally Snow, should now do the very opposite for she would not allow me one moment with Sally, not even to cross in the dance, or whisper, or go anywhere near corner, which is, I said, I intended to do, just by way of practice. While she kept me, at all the evening, as close as possible to Ruth Huckerback, and came up and praised me so to Ruth, times and again, that I declare I was quite ashamed, although, of course, I knew that I deserved it all, but I could not well say that. Then Annie came sailing down the dance with her beautiful hair flowing around her, the lightest figure in all the room, and the sweetest and the loveliest. She was blushing with her fair cheeks red beneath her dear blue eyes, as she met my glance of surprise and grief at the partner she was le leaning on. It was Squire Marwood D. Wichesaw. I was soon have seen her with Tom Fagus, as indeed I had expected, when I heard of Parson Bowden. And to me, it seemed that she had no right to be dancing so with any other, and to this effect I contrived to whisper, but she only said, See to yourself, John. No, but let us both enjoy ourselves. You are not dancing with Lorna, John, but you seem uncommonly happy. Tush, I said. Could I flip about so if I had my love with me? End of chapter 30 Recording by Daisy 55.